Greetings Christchurch Queensboro and to all our friends and family that are watching the service online or listening to it. We trust that we will have a wonderful time together on this new medium of worship. In this month of August, we commemorate Women's Month and we pay tribute to the many women who have not only marched in 1956 to the Union Building, um, protesting or, or highlighting the oppressive past laws, but we highlight important aspects of our daily struggle that women go through, like our mothers, our wives, our uh, children, our sisters, and our friends. So the month of uh, August highlights the contribution that women have made in history and in our contemporary society. The Bible records a beautiful looking woman named Esther who was an orphan. This fascinating Jewish woman who lived in exile later became the Persian king's wife, the Persian king Xerxes. There was a plot by King Xerxes' uh, chief minister, um, Amon, to massacre the Jewish nation. Mordecai, who have raised Queen Esther as his own daughter, informed Esther about the threatened plot, the destruction of the Jews. You can read this account in the Bible, in the book of Esther. This not only saved Esther and Mordecai, but it also ensured that the Jewish community was spared. The life of Esther attributes one of wisdom, more good morals, compassion, faith, courage, and one of hope. We should also clothe our lives with godly character. There are lots of women of noble character that we also know of. One of them that has just gone to be with the Lord, March Fountain. This past Monday was a public holiday for a Women's Day holiday, and we had heard heartbreaking news that Marge, our good friend and mother, has gone to be with the Lord. Marge was a devout Christian. She loved the Lord. She loved the Lord and served him faithfully in whatever duties were given to her. She read and she prayed at her church but before that, she also went to Bible college and graduated with a diploma in theology. She served as a church secretary in Johannesburg for Reverend Ben Dykeman at Christ Church Ilbra before relocating to Kezaden and uh, at Waterfalls Church was also the church secretary. So we say goodbye to a remarkable woman. We won't see her again on the third but we are sure to be able to meet her again in the sweet by and by on that beautiful shore. So with a heart full of uh, sadness, we say goodbye to you, a beautiful woman. Let us pray. Lord, we just want to thank you that we can highlight a few aspects that so often uh, affects not just women, but families, because women play such an important role in the home. I just pray, Lord, that you will be with us as we fellowship, be with the uh, Marge Fountain's family, that they will draw close to you at this time. Be with Reverend Mark Dennison as he shares your word, that it will fall on good grounds. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I hand over, let me say there's two people that are celebrating the birthdays. Uh, on Thursday, it's uh, Jesse Naidu. Jesse, everything of the best. May God richly bless you. And uh, then today, it's um, uh, Pauline uh, Bullion's birthday. She is the mother of Mark Dennison. So we pray that, uh, Mom, that you will have a wonderful day celebrating your 70th birthday. And may God richly bless you. And may you draw close to him and know that he holds your hands. So now... We give you thanks and praise to, to God for you. Now, before I'd like to hand over to another beautiful lady who we love so much. Uh, 
It's a surprise? No, it's Nicolene. Nicolene, over to you. Good day, Christchurch, Queensborough. I'm really grateful to have this brief time to update you on what is happening with me and the Ministry of SIM. Although I'm looking forward to the time when we can meet in person once more. Firstly, I wanted to thank you for your continued support and prayer. I cannot express what it means to know that you have loving support of the home church and that people are upholding you in prayer. I'm reading Colossians, which I found very encouraging. Paul's prayer for the church in Colossae is that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Why? In order that they may live lives worthy of the Lord and will please him. And this is his desire for them, that they would bear fruit and be strengthened and encouraged because of their position in Christ. And in life and in missions, this is our desire to live lives worthy of God and to see many saved into that same hope. Last time I shared a little about the general areas of ministry that I'd been involved in. So for today, I thought I'd share a few particulars with you. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about missions, one resource is the SimNow magazine. The latest edition is now freely available on the Serving in Missions South African website and I contributed a few articles to this edition. I'm praying that God will use it to encourage more people to get involved in missions or ministry um, through prayer, giving or going. Another task that took a lot of my focus was organizing the annual Spiritual Life Conference, which was such a blessing. It's um, an annual highlight where the missionaries normally get together to be refreshed and to fellowship and encourage one another. So it was quite a challenge to think, how can you replicate this online? Um, well, it took a lot of planning and uh, purposeful intent to make it as interactive as possible, uh, to get the content ready and to ensure that everyone could connect. Um, however, I can only thank God for the way in which it came together and the participation and, and positive feedback. Lots of people have been struggling with this lockdown as I'm sure you've experienced. Um, and so it was just so important to be able to encourage them at this time. Lastly, on a personal level, I have been ministering to a Muslim family and have been educating myself with the help of our Muslim ministry team on, on how to witness and reach out to Muslims with the gospel. Um, this has been a real blessing to me because it's just the interaction that I've been able to have now. Um, but I'm really hoping it will also have the, the benefit of uh, enabling me to be a more effective witness. Um, looking forward, I've been in touch with the SIM team in Nigeria to start planning my transition. The timing of which is, is still unknown. Initially, it wasn't my plan to come to Cape Town, but God has used this last year tremendously to prepare me and to enable me to help the ministry team here. Now the mission has called a new director who is due to start in the first three months of next year. Borders are still closed and no firm date for reopening. With this in mind, the tentative plan is to apply for a visa in December and if successful to travel out in January. I may still end up working remotely for the South African office until March, um, but with feet on the ground in Nigeria, I'll be able to start the language learning and the ministry orientation. These are tentative plans and I'm at peace that God will lead. However, I would value your continued prayers that all these things will come together in line with God's will. Once more, thank you for your prayers as this has to stay God's work.
Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne and we want to praise you along with the psalmist of old. How great are your works, O Lord, how profound are your thoughts. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Lord, you know where we stand today. We desire to please you and to walk closely with you. However, we are weak and we turn from your way. Forgive us, Lord. Some of us are, are burdened with heavy responsibilities, loss, broken relationships and frailty. May you help us to claim your peace and to walk in your way and to trust and obey. Lord, with COVID leaving many people in financial difficulty and with winter still upon us, we think of those in need. You constantly remind us of your compassion for those who are weak. We pray for the needs of those who are in our streets, for food and shelter and adequate warmth. Please move us to reach out to others with your love, but also help those structures that exist within the government and charities and churches to be effective in addressing this need. And thank you for all those that are running soup kitchens and providing blankets and shelter, reaching out with practical help in your name. 
and as we think of the aid and August being Women's Month, we pray against corruption and crime and violence, asking that you would help address them through enabling those that are in positions to enforce the law and in working in the hearts of those who are committing the crimes. Lord, this country is yours. We commit it to you. We pray too for our family at Christchurch, Queensborough, thanking you for the grace that you pour out towards us and committing each family to you and into your care. We think especially of Marjorie, thank, thanking you, Lord, for her wonderful testimony and asking for your special presence with her family as they grieve her sudden loss. Comfort them and may the memorial service be a witness and celebration of you. Please be with Mark and Melanie, encouraging and strengthening them as they minister. And we continue to pray for our youth and children, asking that you would have your hand upon them, both for their schooling, but also as we're unable to meet and disciple them, that you would work in their lives. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of today. Help us to discover your presence in each person that we meet and in every event that we encounter. Please give us the gift of simple joy when we undertake all the tasks that you have placed before us. Teach us to speak with wisdom from you and to reveal your righteousness to others that they may praise you. Your word says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. As we commit the remainder of the service to you, we ask that you would speak through Mark. Help us to hear your word and apply it. We pray all these things in your holy and precious name with thanksgiving. Amen. Hear the word of God as it is written in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 49, reading till chapter 13, verses 9. I came to cast fire on the earth, and with that it was already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided against father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be a scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others that lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, 
Let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God. Good morning, church family and any visitors who are joining us. I do trust that you are well. Um, if you haven't already, please pause now and read our passage. Luke chapter 12, verse 49 to chapter 13, verse 9. Well, sadly, one of the words that we hear too often in South Africa is the word hijack. Sadly, getting out of our cars, in our driveways, stopping at intersections is a dangerous activity in our country, especially at night. By listening to the news, reading the newspapers, and speaking to others, we know that we shouldn't be careless in these places, instead, observant. From what we observed in the past, we know that we need to do things like check our mirrors, our blind spots often, keep our doors locked, our windows closed, don't leave valuables on the seat, and don't daydream. We've been told to keep an eye open for any suspicious characters. To keep as safe as possible, we know we have to be observant in our country. In the previous passage in Luke's Gospel, the key word that Jesus wanted us to put into practice was watchfulness. He wanted us to be aware of the dangers of falling asleep spiritually and for Jesus to return to find us living and thinking as if he was never coming back. This week, there's another characteristic that Jesus is looking for in someone who calls themselves one of his disciples, and that is observant. Jesus expects us to be spiritually observant by noticing what is happening around us. God's word to us in the Bible and the consequences of sin all around us are all signs that we ought to be observing. And these signs should be helping us to be ready for his return. Well, let's ask God to help us to do that as we come to his word. Let's pray. Father, hearing your word counts for absolutely nothing unless that word goes into our hearts and minds and changes us. Please switch us on if we are distracted or sleepy so that we can give our full attention to your son as he deserves. Help me to speak clearly and I pray no one here listening will be gullible or stubborn. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing to notice, my first point, is that unity with Jesus leads to division on earth. Unity with Jesus lead, leads to division on earth. Look from verse 49, where Jesus said, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it was already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. Jewish expectation of God's promised king from the Old Testament was that he would come and unite God's people to fight under him against their enemies. Jesus, though, had a much bigger mission. His people were not exclusively the Jews, but rather anybody who would repent of their sins and accept him as their king. God's enemies were not the Romans or the Samaritans, but anyone who rejected Jesus as, as God's appointed king. God didn't want people to be unprepared for this type of Messiah. And so before he arrived, he sent prophets to the Jews. The last Old Testament prophet that God sent was John the Baptist to prepare people for Jesus' arrival. Back in 
Luke chapter 3, verse 17, John the Baptist announced um, about the coming of the Christ. He said the following, His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus didn't only come to bring, bring peace on earth, but also judgment. Depending on how people responded to Jesus, Jesus would either bring a baptism of fire or a baptism by the Holy Spirit. Jesus would not bring unity among all mankind, but rather a ministry that would divide people. Jesus would separate this world into those who accepted him and those who rejected him as king. During Jesus' ministry, he had seen the lack of love for God in people's lives. He had seen the greed and the arrogance of those people who were meant to be spiritual leaders. He's seen the consequences of sin. Possession by demons, sickness, paralysis, spiritual blindness, and death. All these things have angered Jesus. And so in verse 49, he says that he wishes that he could end it all now. All it would take is a simple request to God the Father. And Jesus could bring down the fire of judgment that this world deserves because of our godlessness. Although that would be fair, we know that Jesus isn't only angered by sin, he is also distressed by it. He loves us, and he knows that God's coming judgment would be more than any of us could bear. It wasn't for his if it wasn't for his upcoming baptism, that is. This baptism that he's referring to is his death. Jesus knew that without his death, there would be no hope for us escaping God's judgment for our sins. The imagery of baptism is a flood of God's judgment on Jesus, which no doubt was distressing to Jesus. Jesus experiences this flood so that those who accept him as their king will be spared this judgment themselves. In verse 50, Jesus also said that he looked forward to the completion of his baptism. The word completion can also be used for a debt being paid off. Jesus facing the flood of God's wrath means that his people's debt of sin to God is paid off. There's no flood left to face. Not even a cent remains outstanding. It may be strange to think of Jesus' ministry as one that divides people because we remember at his birth, all the way back in chapter 2, verse 14, the angels announced that Jesus would bring peace on earth. But we forget, especially on our Christmas cards, don't we, that the angels also said that God's peace will rest only on those on whom God's favor or God's grace rests. Remember that I described the baptism that Jesus has to go through as a flood of God's judgment. Those who accept him as their king will be baptized, not by God's judgment, but by God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like an engagement ring that says, I belong to God, and there is now peace between us and I live firstly for his kingdom. As a citizen of God's kingdom, it means that we are now aliens in this world. It means that we're not going to fit into our families 
and our cultures like we used to. We now have a totally different reason for living and a new perspective on life. This is why the cross divides this world and sometimes even our homes in two, as Jesus warns us from verse 52. I remember at Bible College, we were once given a moving testimony by a young Islamic man from Sudan who had converted to Christianity. His family, particularly his father, became furious to the point where his, this young man feared for his life. His mother called him into the kitchen and gave him a packed lunch. She told him to, to quickly pack a bag and, and run for his life. She hugged and kissed her son like she'd never see him again, and off he ran. He ran as far as his, as his legs could carry him, still trying to come to terms with how his life had been turned upside down so quickly. After resting, he started eating that lunch his mother had packed, wondering if he'd ever taste her food again. That was the last memory that he had that day. He woke up in a hospital, he found out later that he was found unconscious and taken to hospital. His stomach had been pumped because his mother had poisoned his lunch. This is an extreme example, I know. But how can so much hatred come between a mother and her own child? Can there be anything more painful in this life than knowing that the people we care for the most and spend the most time with, ignore, misunderstand, and even hate Jesus, the person that we love the most above all. There is no guarantee that our spouses, relatives, and children will accept our king as their king. People can normally accept us if we support different sports teams, if we have different tastes in music or clothes. Our country is slowly learning to get along with people of different culture and races, but so often families and friends will be divided over Jesus. Our lives are overwhelmed by God's love for us, and we want to say thank you to God with all of our lives. And we want to share him with everyone who still is not forgiven by God. And as a result, division on earth is inevitable. As a church family, we must especially look out for and care for those of our brothers and sisters who do not get spiritual support and encouragement at home. There will often be friction on how to raise the children, loneliness when they can't talk about something that worries them spiritually. There is also a sadness of not being able to share and pray with others at home. If you are in that type of situation, please keep in touch with us. We are your spiritual family. And even if you can't talk about Jesus to your loved ones, talk to Jesus about your loved ones. Ask him to show them what he is like and soften their hearts to him. We must also show those who don't know Jesus what he is like by the way that we live. Obviously, the other side of the coin is that if we are Christian, unity amongst God's children is meant to build us up in the faith and be an advert for God's kingdom on earth so that we, we must work really hard at loving one another, even while we are separated by this lockdown. Well, the second point is that we have no excuse to miss reconciliation to God. Whoever you are, 
we have no excuse to miss reconciliation to God. I get that from verse 54 to 59 of chapter 12. Jesus noted that the average Jew around him could look at the environmental conditions without trouble and work out if it was going to rain. They could read the weather. But Jesus was astounded that they could not work out what God was doing amongst them through his ministry. Technology is incredible. It is enabling us to read the warning signs to prepare us for events, natural events like hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes, droughts, global warming, cold fronts, and rain. Through this technology, lives are saved. We know how to dress, and farmers can plan how best to manage their crops and livestock. This type of technology gives us a sense of safety and makes us feel pretty clever that we are mastering the environment. But if we can figure out by looking up at the sky that we need to take the washing in before it starts raining, but we ignore Jesus' warning to us of God's coming judgment, do you see what he calls us in verse 56? Hypocrites. How can we be ex experts at keeping our washing dry and knowing when to pack a jersey, but we don't observe the signs about God's approaching judgment, and we don't observe the call that Jesus offers to escape that judgment? It is written plainly in these pages of our Bibles and in a language that we can understand. We have no excuse to not be ready for what lies ahead and how we can be saved from it. This is a very urgent call by Jesus to us. To use our God-given brains. Look at verse 57. Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? Jesus here is telling us to think. Think about it as if we were on our way to court. Normally by the time we are heading to the courtroom, it means that we have given up on trying to fix the problem ourselves. The other person has now become our adversary. We're beyond negotiations and everyone's in a bad mood and, and ready to fight it out legally. Jesus is telling us that it is not like that with God. Even on the way to court, it's not too late to make peace with and be reconciled to God. We're foolish anyway to have God as an, as an adversary. There is still time to repent and ask him to forgive our sins. In court, what are we doing? We're appealing for justice. And for that reason, we don't want this case to even get to court. We want anything but justice from God because our sins against him and towards one another means that the only verdict we'll receive is guilty and we will never be able to settle our debt. That's why Jesus says in verse 59, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last cent. That we have a new day today is proof that God is still on his way to court. Until that judgment day, there is still time to plead guilty to ask for grace and forgiveness, to have our debt paid in full by Jesus and be reconciled to God. Have you been reconciled to this God? 
but we mustn't think that we have all the time in the world. This is an urgent call. And our final point is that tragedy is an urgent reminder to repent. Tragedy is an urgent reminder to repent. As South Africans, we know that there's always some current tragedy happening around us. And it was no different in Israel um, during chapter 13. And some people asked Jesus to interpret the meaning of those tragedies. The first disaster we are told about in chapter 13 verse 1 was by human hands. And the second one in verse 4 was an accident. Maybe they had a copy of the Jerusalem Times with them and they were trying to figure out what was God trying to say about those who died in those two terrible tragedies. God is after all in, in control of everything. So what did the Galileans do wrong to die in such a freak accident as a tower falling on them? What is God saying through it all? Just like the example, if you remember, of the rich farmer two weeks ago who had a bumper crop, but we saw that it wasn't a sign of blessing for specific faithfulness. So too, in these tragedies, Jesus tells us in verse 2, that these two recent disasters were not signs of God's judgment on a, on a specific sin. It's not Christian to think, I'm having bad luck, so God must be angry with me, or I'm having good luck, so God must approve of me. The victims of these tragedies were not worse sinners than anybody else. As Christians, we are not immune from car accidents, crime, or cancer. So what must we learn from tragedy? And with social media and the news, we hear about it all over the world. What must we learn? It is clear in verse 3. Jesus says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. And in verse 5, in case we missed it, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. A far worse disaster awaits if anybody does not repent of their sins before God. Tragedy is not God picking on, on us. It is a siren that reverberates all over the world, a, a warning. It's a reminder that because of sin, this kingdom that we live in is temporary. All life is fragile, unpredictable. And the main point Jesus makes is that we mustn't waste time, the time that God has given us. Jesus compares that situation to a farm owner in verse 6, I know people, many people, who have had lychee trees in their gardens, or avocados, or macadamia nut trees. Maybe you're one of them. And those trees have refused to produce fruit. All those trees are doing are dropping leaves, leaves that need to be raked up. They kill the grass under the trees. In the same way, a farmer that is growing a fig tree does so for one purpose, and that is to produce figs. A fig tree with no figs is not, oh well, it's still a pretty tree. It's simply a waste of space to the farmer. It's using up water and nutrients in the soil. An unrepentant life is a waste of a life. We might have great accomplishments and we've ticked off our bucket list, 
We might have completed the Comrades Marathon, do well in business, and raise a happy, well-rounded family. And those are all good achievements. But they count for nothing without repentance. We were created to be in a blessed relationship with God. And unless we are reconciled to Him through Jesus Christ, all we're doing with our lives is testing God's patience. If we waste the time for repentance that God has given us, how many years has God given you so far if you have not come to this point yet? Well, tragedy all around us is meant to remind us that we never know how long we might have until that judgment, God's judgment, lands on us. Well, as we close, I don't want anyone leaving this broadcast and thinking that God is nasty, cold, or unfair. As in the illustration that Jesus gave, three years was the fair time needed for that fig tree to start bearing fruit as God allowed it. If it was fruitless after three years, it was cut down to make way for another tree. But just like the farm worker who pleads with the farm owner for more time, for the tree to give it some special extra treatment, God is also patient with us, giving us more warnings and more reminders to stop wasting time and repent before him. One more sermon, one more Bible study, just a little more time to read the Bible, a brush with death or sickness, or some more time exposed to a Christian that you respect. It's the heart of our God who loves us, who wants none of us to waste these warnings and face his judgment unprepared. He wants us to settle with him before that dreadful day. It's our God who gives his own son to completely pay the debt of our sin so that not one cent is left. And he does it on the cross that we can be re reconciled to him and he to us. Brothers and sisters, friends, do not waste this wonderful opportunity. Let us pray. Father, you have given us the ministry of sharing Jesus with others. We confess at times that our behavior mocks rather than glorifies your name. Please forgive us and keep molding us into fruitful role models for your kingdom. We ask this trusting not in our goodness, but in Jesus' sacrifice for us. Father, thank you for your patience with us for some of us many, many decades. We know that you would have been perfectly just to judge us for our sins. We praise you for preparing us through your prophets and especially through your son. Please will you give us opportunities to prepare others for the day of your return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.